Hello, my name is Sandy Bowman. Today's date is August 22nd, 2019. And I am the Executive Director of the Life Center here in Cumberland County, and that's where we are today. I want to welcome you. This, this afternoon, our guest is uh, Sue Smizer, not commonly known as Carolyn Sue Smizer. Uh, we're, I'm representing the Historical Society's Genealogical Museum, currently located in Greenup in Cumberland County, Illinois. And I'm the host of today's program. We are filming Cumberland County's people, places, and things, and hoping to capture memories today of Sue Smizer, uh, so that people in the future, maybe that's you watching now, can watch and enjoy and learn a little bit about your history. So tonight we have Sue Smizer, and we want to get your name exactly correct. It is Carolyn Sue White Smizer. Carolyn Sue White Smizer. All yes. right. Uh, welcome. Thank you. And it's nice to it's see nice you. It's nice to be here. And Sue actually works with me here in the Life Center. So I see her every day. So I'm not meeting her for the first time uh, right now. But uh, she is certainly a joy to work with. And we're very happy that you've agreed to do this. I know this is not a, an easy thing. It's not something you usually do. And I'm much more relaxed at writing things than I am at speaking. So this is going to be a little bit of a struggle for me, but I think we'll get through it. And Sue is an amazing writer. That is true. So um, is it any of our business how old you are? Well, I was born toward the end of World War II, so I'm old enough to know better and too young to resist. <laughs> All right, and, and you are married? I am married. Uh, my husband's name is Bob Smizer, Robert Allen Smizer, and I met him on a blind date. And uh, after our first date, I went home and my mother said, well, what did you think of him? And I said, I thought he was a great big smart aleck. <laughs> <laughs> but we dated again and we worked out our little differences and Actually, we dated for four years before we got married, and uh, it's worked well. We've been married 57 years. Oh, my. That's quite a while. It is. And you seem to get along pretty well. Yeah, pretty well. And he is a smart aleck. <laughs> still, I tell him that from time to time. You still are a smart aleck. <laughs> he is. He's a lot of fun. So do you have children? We do. Uh, we have four sons, James Allen, John Michael, Mark Stephen and Daniel Lee. Um, we lost our youngest one when he was 20 years old. He was involved in a terrible car wreck and the, the truck caught fire. So that was a sad time in our lives. But um, we still have three living sons. We have grandchildren and we even have great grandchildren. That's wonderful. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your life with Bob, your marriage, and through the years? Well, we've lived in several different places. Our, I guess our most favorite is out in the country. But I was a small town girl, and he was raised in the country. He was raised around pigs and cows and things I never grew up with and had hardly even seen. So in the early days of our marriage, we moved out in the country. I think we had two children. And he wanted to get into some pigs, so we bought two sows. And in time, the sows had little baby pigs. And they were, they were not very big when they were six weeks old, but he hollered and said, Susie, come out here. I need your help. These little pigs are out, and I can't get them back in. <laughs> so. I wasn't exactly sure whether I wanted to do that or not, but being the obedient wife I was, I grabbed a broom. <laughs> I went outside with my broom, and Bob said, what are you going to do with that broom? And I said, I'm going to keep those pigs away from me. <laughs> so we got him back in, but uh, I think I was a little bit trying and a little bit annoying to him because I was so afraid of those little bitty baby pigs. 
So how long were you out in the country? Oh, we've lived in the country most of the time we were married. We've just been in town just a little bit. But I, I wanted to show a picture of my mom and dad. Oh. And, uh, okay. They met in 1942 and married in 1940. Well, they might have met before 42, but they were married in 1942. And uh, he was in the Army, and Mom, uh, Mom had not been allowed to date. She, her parents were pretty strict with her, and so she thought that he was pretty good looking, and he thought she was, and uh, he asked her to marry him. And I found a letter that he had written to her the other day and I read through it and it was so tender and he was just so in love with her. It was amazing to read the letter. And then they were, had been married two years when I was born. Mm -hmm. And I have one brother, Calvin Steve. And don't ask me why. They called me Carolyn Sue and called me Susie. They named him Calvin Steve and call him Stevie. <laughs> just, hmm. I don't know. But my dad, um, as I said, we, I have a brother, Steve, and when Steve was uh, almost 12, Dad took Steve and a friend of his out to the lake, uh, Mattoon Lake, and they were, um, they were fishing and swimming and just having fun. And my brother and his friend got out into deep water, and uh, they couldn't get out of it. And oh. so they hollered for help, and. Dad jumped in, and he was able to throw both of them up to safety, but he was unable to get himself out. Oh. But he died a hero, and uh, I have a great-grandson now that his parents named them Calvin because they said, your dad was a hero, Grammy, so we're going to name our baby Calvin. Oh. So that, that was nice. pretty nice. That is nice. Oh, well, that had to have been hard. No, that was hard because I was 16, my brother was not quite 12, and and it was a tough time, but we made it through it. Yeah. yeah. And um, okay. I was going to talk a little bit about the downtown business district. It's not a great okay. big business district of Neoga, but um, if you were at the, what, there's a stoplight in Neoga now, one stoplight in the whole town. And if you go west, you go across the tracks and turn left on the very first road there. You would go down and, uh, now this is my memory of what Neoga looked like in the oh, mid 1950s to the early 1960s. So I remember uh, if you would turn left on that first street and go down almost to where the, the water tower is. There was a small brick building there, and it was a gun shop, Sam Alt's gun shop. And my dad spent a lot of time in that gun shop because he, he was an outdoor person. He, he liked to go fishing and hunting, and I have a picture in my mind of him sitting on our living room floor, Indian style, with a, a rifle, not a rifle, a revolver, and he would take the sights off of the guns and he would file them and put them on the guns and sight things up. But he was always in Sam Alt's shop doing, getting bluing for his guns or whatever he needed to get. And next to that place, we had the Neoga News. And it was fully functioning back in those days. They had a printing press, they printed the news, and. Uh, I have been in there. It was a pretty nice place to be. N now the Neoga News is, is done by the Toledo Democrat here in Toledo. And next to the Neoga News, there was just a vacant lot, and next to it was a large Kern manufacturing building. And in that one, they made brassiers, and I think they made nightgowns in there too, but my grandma worked and that building where Kern Manufacturing was. And it was Grandma Cass Stevens, Bessie Cass Stevens, and some of you probably will remember her. And then, if you went across the road, still going north, uh, there was a building that was an insurance agency that was ran by Floyd Curl. And 
Right next to that is the store that I remember the most from my childhood. And it was Crothers by Wright Grocery Store. And you would enter that front door. The, the building had two large glass windows, display windows, and, you, and uh, an inset where you would walk up on it and then open the door and walk inside. And I was in there a lot with my grandma uh, back in the 50s, early 50s. And the thing that would you would see when you would first walk through the door was a curved glass display case. And it held handkerchiefs, ladies' handkerchiefs. And I remember just standing there. I wasn't tall enough to see over the top and look down into it, so I would stand facing the front glass looking at the handkerchiefs and then if you would walk just to the left of that display case there was an area where they sold shoes and work boots and bib overalls and shirts and jackets and coats and I always thought today I'm thinking that store was like a small Walmart store mm -hmm. because it had just a little bit of everything in it and then uh, if you would walk uh, a little bit away from the shoe area, you would come to a display case, not a glass one, just a wooden display case that held school supplies that had notebooks and pencils and scissors and crayons and um, tablets and rulers and pencil boxes and all things that children would need who were getting ready to go to school. And I remember uh, looking through a coloring book that was there and opening the color book and somebody had colored a page in the book and then <laughs> closed the book again, put it back. Oh, so then going back to the curved display case, if you would go to the right of that, there was uh, an area there where they sold bolts of cloth. They had fabric of every kind you could ever want and Esther Crothers was the person behind the counter and while she had a yardstick nailed down on the counter when she measured the material it was always like this so some people <laughs> you, depending on the length of your arm you got a short yard or a long yard but that's how she measured it and there was thread there was just uh, all kinds of thread that you could buy there in that area and then you would walk a little bit further past the material and, and that was an area that sold dishes and knickknacks and things to hang on the wall. And it was pretty interesting just to, as a child to go in there and see the things that they had. And then walking on back to where they sold the groceries, back at the back of the store was the meat market and Shirley Kep was the meat guy that kept the display case full of hamburger and uh, steak and pork chops and bacon and everything that you could want. And back in the 50s, hamburger was 55 cents a pound, and if it was on sale, it was 35 cents a pound. And down in front of the meat case, there were all kinds of sweet things, little square cakes with frosting sprinkled with coconut icing oh. and uh, little Debbie's and just all kinds of sweet things. And then there was, of course, healthier things like bananas and fruit. And at the end of the meat case, in those days, they bought uh, farm fresh eggs. And so they had a candling place there and I remember seeing, uh, I don't remember who it was, but someone sitting there holding the egg up to a light to make sure there wasn't a little baby chick inside of it. And then Crothers bought the, the store that was just off to the side of them. So they opened up the wall there and then they moved more groceries into that part of the store. Now, of course, that grocery store is located across the road and it's a big supermarket now but that was a nice store to go in and it holds a lot of memories for me. So leaving the Crothers grocery store right next to it was Shorts Furniture 
and it had a big variety of things in it too, uh, sofas and bedroom uh, outfits, the couches, chairs. They sold refrigerators and all kinds of appliances. They sold linoleum and carpet. They had very nice carpet and I think it was Mohawk, Mohawk carpet, it was good. And then the, back in a small room, back where you would pay for things, they had an area where they sold wallpaper. And you could go back in that little room and choose what kind of wallpaper or paint that you wanted to put in your house. And right next to Short Furniture Store, well, going back to Short Furniture again, when they got the appliances out of the boxes, they put them out in the alley. And when I was in the fifth grade, we went down to the alley and we brought two or three of those great big appliance boxes over to my grandpa's house because he babysat me and my brother and my cousin. When I was in fifth grade and my brother was, I don't know, maybe second or third grade and my cousin was mm, third grade probably. And so we set those up out in his backyard and we, those were our clubhouses and mm -hmm. our everything house, a pirate ship or whatever we wanted it to be. But going back to Crothers Store and Short Furniture, if you would continue on north, there was a store there, the locker plant. And I was only in it one, once or twice that I remember. I went in there with uh, my girlfriend because her mother had sent her downtown to get something out of, you could rent locker space in there. Hmm. And I remember her going over to the locker, turning a key, opening it up, and getting some kind of meat out of there, and then taking it home. So I thought that was rather unusual, but it was pretty neat, too. And right next to there, there was a building that had been used for a variety of things. I think the American Legion is in that building now, but then um, there was a a doctor's office, Dr. Jim Sack had a office in that building. And it also, that I can remember, housed the very first library that Neoga had. It wasn't very big, it didn't have very many books in it, but it's where the first library was set up that I can recall. recall. And right next to that was Dan's, or Don Clayball's barbershop. And it was still there up into the 80s, I think, late 70s or early 80s before it closed. So I think, now this would be, have been before my time, but if you would continue on north across that road, there had been a gas station, a filling station there, and it's now torn down and there's a liquor store in its place. But, um, so now we have to go east across the railroad tracks. Nyoga has two places that you can cross the tracks there. At the time I was growing up, there were three places, and we always called one of them the high crossing, but it was dangerous just outside of town. There were no gates, no warning lights, no nothing, and they finally clo closed that down, so that was good. But if you uh, cross the tracks, you would find uh, before you, just before you, we get to Route 45, there were two gas stations, and the, one of them was the Sinclair gas station, and the other one was Pat's Marathon. And on Friday nights, when I was a little girl, um, there wasn't a whole lot to do in the town. It did have a movie theater, but um, what people did in those days was to go uptown and sit and watch the people. Mm -hmm. We people watched. Mm -hmm. And Dad would put us in the car and rent us uptown, and he would back into the parking place so that the rear end of the car was near the railroad tracks and the front was facing uh, the stores across the highway. And then we would walk across the road to Soward's Drug Store. And they had small tables, a little bit smaller than this table we're sitting at. And they had chairs, four chairs around the table. I think they probably had four or five chairs in there, and tab or tables and chairs like that. And they had a soda fountain, and they had an ice cream uh, 
uh, I don't know what you call it, but it held ice cream and it was, you had to raise the lids up and get yep. your ice cream mm -hmm. from out inside of it. Freezer. Freezer. Ice cream yeah, freezer. that would work. And we usually got milkshakes and the, they would mix the milkshakes up in metal containers this tall. Maybe I'm exaggerating there. And then they would pour that into a, a glass that started out big and got smaller down at the bottom with a footed stem on the bottom, bring that and set it on our table, and then set that metal part on there, and it would be one-third to one-half full. So you'd drink all that milkshake that you could hold and then pour the rest of it in there if you still could hold any more of it. And we would do that on Friday night. And then uh, usually we'd get a, a comic book that they sold for 10 cents and take it back across the road. Mom and Dad would get in the car and people watch, and I would sit in front of the car on the bumper and read my comic book. And I don't know what my brother did because he was four years younger than me, so I really didn't pay attention to him. But um, let's see here. Soured's Drug Store. And I'm going to go north of Soward's Drug Store for just a minute because that was the corner building. And at first it housed uh, Bob Mayhall's leather shop. And he cut leather of all kinds. I, I don't know what they did with it, but I just know that there was always scraps of leather out in the alley and laying on the sidewalk. And sometimes we would pick up the scraps and you could hook them together and create a belt, but there was never any way to fasten the belt. Once you got the belt made, it was just the belt with no way to fasten it. And after the leather shop, it became a resale shop. And Joe and Ruth operated these, the resale shop. And I don't know really what all they had in there because I was only interested in comic books. And you could take two of your comic books up there and trade them for one comic book. So I did that quite often until I ran myself out of comics. Mm -hmm. And after the resale shop, it sat vacant for a while. And then Gary Mercer bought it and he had a, he had turned it into a pharmacy. So it was Mercer's Pharmacy and that's where the pharmacy still is today, although it's not Mercer's. So now I'm going to go south. Um, from the drugstore and that's where uh, Kern, it was a small Kern manufacturing because the big one was across the tracks if you'll recall I, I said that's where my grandma Cass Stevens worked and in the small one um, my mom worked she went there in 1953 started working there and they made underwear and they made girdles and in those days, ladies wore girdles, and they had mm -hmm. things inside the girdles that you would put on a pair of hose, pull the hose up, and fasten them to these little fasteners. I don't, I don't know so, what they yeah. were called. I don't remember either what they were called. But I they held your them. hose up. <laughs> and after current manufacturing, still going south, there was a restaurant called the Gingham Inn, and it was ran by Rosie Lucan, and she made uh, beef Manhattans that were really, really good, and once in a great while, that's where we would go and have a beef Manhattan. And next to the Gingham Inn was the McGinnis Repair Shop, and it was a huge, they could get big trucks inside of there, and I... It had a glass front on it, too. I think most of the stores along there did. But I remember that's where my girlfriend's dad worked, in the McGinnis garage, and I was in there with her. They had two or three big trucks in there working on them. And after it was the McGinnis garage, I think, is when they turned it into the Neoga Fire Station, because that is what my memory is telling me. And not sure when all that happened, but right next to that then is the Swingle Funeral Home, and it's still there to this day. And let's see, I can't think of anything else. It started out as the Swingle Funeral Home, and uh, Fred Swingle started the funeral home. Uh, that was before my time. 
and he had a son named Dean Swingle who took over operating it when his dad died and uh, Dean had a, had two kids one named Bob Swingle and Judy Swingle and Bob I'm a doctor and Judy was a nurse for a while and I used to babysit for them and in the passage of time uh, Judy got married to uh, an Odell Joe Odell and he's deceased now but they lived in the funeral home and when I was 12 years old I started babysitting and I babysat in the funeral home <laughs> and I wasn't exactly sure how I was going to feel about that but I went in the funeral home and Judy's dad was there and he said here I want to take you around here and just show you a little bit so he took me in where where they put the bodies when people are going there to view them and he said now this is Claude and Claude will not hurt you <laughs> so oh. he put me at ease I knew that Claude was going to stay in the casket <laughs> and he wasn't going to get out and come get me oh, gosh. so then I went back in the part of the house that they lived in and Judy and Joe left and and Dean left and uh I babysat the kids, and I was over there from time to time. Um, it was a lot of fun in there. Like I said, it was kind of scary at first. but And then I was dating Bob a little after that, and so he would sometimes go over there and help me corral the kids. But um, Dean Swingle lived right next door to my grandpa, my grandparents. So we kind of all grew up in the same neighborhood, and their son Bob... Dean Swingle's son, Bob, lived just across the road after he got married and became a doctor. So it was just all one little tight-knit community. And I was saying that I had babysat, but I also babysat for the superintendent of the high school. And they lived just across the road from us when I babysat for him. And I guess I, I might have been a freshman in high school when I was there, but there was a teacher at the high school that lived just down the block from all of us, and I was babysitting on Halloween, and this teacher came and knocked on the door, and I went to the door, and here stood a ghost with a sheet over his head, and he was like this, and not knowing who it was, I said, what have we got here, a hump-shouldered ghost? And he took the sheet off, and it was my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so I was kind of a little bit embarrassed there, but it was fun anyway. And, okay, I'm going to go across the road from the leather shop. Now I'm going to go north from the leather shop and, and Mercer's Pharmacy. And that's where the Cumberland County Bank is. Or it was the first mid bank now first mid bank but at that time it was Cumberland County Bank and I actually have a picture of my mother oh. standing by that bank when uh -huh. it was the Cumberland County Bank so I think that's a pretty cool picture and I'm sure we'll get a better mm -hmm. shot of it here in mm -hmm. a little bit but um, so right next to that bank uh, was Kreitz's restaurant and it was a big restaurant. I, I only remember that it had pinball machines in it. So after school, the boys would always head up there to shoot pinball machines and stuff. And right next to that was a store called Bob Cass Stevens Grocery Store. And although he was probably distant relative to my grandparents, he, he wasn't a close relative. But he did operate that store. And right next to that was the Neoga Theater, which for a while became the um, Masonic Lodge. And somewhere in that area is where Bob Swingle had set up his doctoring practice. So that was the business district, as I recall it, um, in Neoga. It sounds like it was a... a quite a bit larger business district than is there today. It was. With two restaurants and a theater, and I notice in this picture of the bank, it looks like they're two or three stories 
high buildings mm -hmm. that go on down the block. When I was, was really young, like maybe four or five years old, I can remember going farther down from the bank there to a, a grocery store that I, I think was called Kroger's Grocery Store. And for a while, I think it was a Piggly Wiggly, but I was in there with my grandma. So, yeah, it had quite a few grocery stores mm -hmm. and uh, restaurants. It was a little booming town for a while. Yeah. But I have a picture of my grandpa. Okay. He played a, a big part in my life, so. And yeah. this was your grandpa? Cass Stevens. Cass Stevens. Grandpa, and Cass what Stevens. was his first name? Orville. Orville. And he was married to Bessie Cass Stevens. And this is a picture. Everybody in this picture looks like they just ate lemons. <laughs> I don't know what they do. <laughs> that's his family. Um, okay. All except one little girl that died when she was four years old. Oh. But um, I don't know why they all look so unhappy. My mother, though, she kind of looks like she's having a good time mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, as I said, my grandpa babysat us whenever I was growing up. And he improvised different things to entertain us. He made um, a pair of stilts, or two pair of stilts for us to walk around on. So we had a lot of fun teetering around and balancing on the stilts. And he got a wooden barrel somewhere. And he took it apart and strung it up and made a hammock. And oh. we would sit on that hammock <laughs> and we just had, we could talk about and solve all the world's problems oh that ever happened. You would just, the neighborhood kids would come over and that hammock would hold us all. Mm -hmm. And he had a pear tree in his yard that we would s climb up and one branch jutted out just like that. And it would hold uh, three or four of us girls that would sit there and solve all the problems of the world too. So yeah, we had a good time. Can there. I go back to this little picture for mm -hmm. just a minute? Can you tell me who all these people are? This is your grandpa, yes. Cat Orville, Cass Stevens. And that is Lloyd Cass Stevens. Which and he is that on your mother's or father's side? Uh, my mother's side. Lloyd Cass Stevens actually was the manager of the small Kern Manufacturing that my mom worked at. Okay. And the man next to him is Don Cass Stevens, my uncle. And then in the middle is my mom and her mom, Bessie Eva Cass Stevens. And so this was your grandma. That was my grandma. And your grandma and, and grandpa on either side. Yeah. And the little girl in front is Louise Cass Stevens. That must have been a thing because her name was Dolores Louise and they called her Louise. <laughs> they just, they put a first, nowadays it seems like you, they give you a middle name but you always go by your first name. I know. But then they, in your family in anyway, family, they, yeah, they, they put a, a first name yes, but you always went by did. the middle. Well, that's uh -huh. okay. So, uh, when I was in the fifth grade, uh, my teacher was Mrs. Roy and she asked us if we would find a, a historical person or someone famous and look up information about him or, or her and just bring that information and we would talk about it in our class. So I went to my grandpa and I said, Grandpa, I am going to do a story about Davy Crockett. Do you know anything about Davy Crockett? And he said, well, yes, I do, as a matter of fact. And he said, he actually is kinfolk of ours from way back. And so he told me a little bit about him, about Davy Crockett. And then the next time I went over there, he had sat down and with pencil had written, I think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pages of information about his family and how they were related to Davy Crockett. And in some of the information that I read, some of the people, because I have information from different family members here, and some of them seem to think that he was a closer relative than he actually was when I actually delved into this. Um, I want to talk for just a second. I'm, I'm getting there, but I have to do something else first. This is a picture of my grandpa, Cass Stevens, when he was a little boy. He looks like little Lord Fauntleroy <laughs> in his little suit. And he had very curly blonde hair. And he's standing beside his grandma, 
Mariah Crockett Cass Stevens. And her dad was Elliot Crockett. And some of the people had thought that Elliot was the son. Elliot's dad and mom were the parents of Elliot and Davy Crockett. That actually did not turn out to be the case. Um, Elliot's dad and Davy Crockett's dad were brothers. So that made Davy Crockett and her dad cousins. So that cleared up some of the mystery that I kind of thought that was Davy Crockett's mother, but it's not. It's this, the tin type photo I have is either Mariah's mother or it's her husband, Elliot Crockett's mother. And they all traveled across the mountains from Tennessee to Cumberland County together. And they are buried in the Ellis Cemetery, but that's in Moultrie County or Shelby County, I think. But anyway, that cleared up some of the uh, confusion that I was having because I, looked, I Googled to find out the brothers of Davy Crockett, and I couldn't find a brother named Elliot. I did this just okay. yesterday. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, where's Elliot? And so I began reading and reading and looking, and I found out that Elliot, his dad, and Davy Crockett's dad were brothers. So, okay. so that was pretty cool. That's very cool. And this is Mariah sitting in a car, a touring car, I suppose, and it was taken in 1914. So she uh, liked to get out and get about, I guess. Maybe she was going shopping. Who knows? Um, I am not sure what else we want to talk about. Well, um, do you have anything else about your genealogy that you want to share? You have some more pictures well, there. Well, this is my Grandpa Cass Stevens. This is the family he grew up with. That's the original, and that's a copy that I made off of it, but it's clearer. Okay. And I do not know who all those are, except I know he had several sisters and one brother named Charlie. Um, is he in the middle? Is he with the curly hair? Grandpa? Uh-huh. Grandpa is the little bitty kid. The little one. Oh, yeah. okay. Over that's, on the right. That's my grandpa, okay. and Charlie is the older brother. And uh, I suppose as little brothers go, my grandpa was probably a nuisance to his older brother because grandpa told me that one time he, Charlie wanted to go fishing and grandpa wanted to go with him, and Charlie said no you aren't going and mother said yes he is you're taking him fishing with you so they got to the fishing hole and charlie was busy getting his fishing pole in the water grandpa climbed up a tree and was laying out on a branch looking down in the water and he got dizzy from watching the water and fell in the water <laughs> So Charlie had to take him back home, and I'm sure that being the older brother, he was not happy with his younger brother. <laughs> but uh, his, Grandpa's parents were Martha Ellen Reynolds Cass Stevens. So that would be this lady yes, here? Uh -huh. and, and Ebenezer Cass and Stevens Ebenezer. is the father. And I know the sisters were Mame and Ora and Nora and Bertha, but I don't know which is which. So, and this is another picture of Ebenezer and Martha Ellen Cass Stevens. Without all the children between them. Yes. <laughs> and this postcard I found, and I thought it was so funny with the frogs on it, because the message on the back is from Grandpa Cass Stevens, and it says he was sending this to Mariah Cass Stevens. And it says, Dear Grandma, Pa and Ma are coming down soon if they don't fall off of that leaf. We are all well and hope you are too. We'll see you soon, Orville Cass Stevens. So he, he had a sense of humor. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Uh, and th this okay. is just a, a map 
that one of the Cass Stevens drew of how the countryside, it's, it's not unfortunately Cumberland County though, but it shows different places where family members had lived. And this is the Ellis Cemetery where Mariah Cass Stevens and Granny uh, Becky uh, Crockett are buried. And you can't even get in there now because there's a farm there's a road going in front of it and a farm and it's all fields. So to get back there, you have to go into the farm's driveway and ask permission to go back through farm country to get into that little cemetery. Where, where is that located? I think it's in Moultrie County. And what's the name? Here's Gaze. It looks like Gaze is up there. Yeah. What's the name of the cemetery? Ellis, the Ellis, Ellis Cemetery. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. And we'll let we hold this down a little because you'll this map will probably be back here. Okay. I'll and if it, we yeah, hold it up, right. all right. Well, in some of the history that I was reading um, from the Cass Stevens, it said that uh, the family had bought land on the west side of the railroad track, and they owned land. It said from from Mattoon to Windsor all along, and they had bought it for a dollar and 25 cents an acre. And that would have been um, uh, Ebenezer's dad, Jasper Cass Stevens, had bought that and I guess they farmed, I don't know, but anyway, that's just a little homegrown map that somebody made kind of nice. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. And I do have a picture of the high school. Unfortunately, that's all I have is, is a picture because they've torn down my high school. I think they kept uh, one gym that they incorporated into the new school that they built. And I have a tomahawk with a picture inside oh. of the school and a bunch of the kids. Some of those I went to school with right there. I don't think I'm in the picture, but... And the tomahawk is? That's the yearbook, the yearbook that uh, Neoga High School has. Okay. Do you remember, where did you go to grade school? I went to the Neoga grade school, and that's how I got started in on the Crockett ancestry because my fifth grade teacher asked me, or asked us to do a story about mm -hmm. him. But that teacher, I was scared to death of. She was very, very loud and I one day was in there and I wasn't paying attention. I was daydreaming somewhere. I don't know what. And she called on me to answer the question. I didn't even know what the question was. <laughs> and I conjured up a white fib and I said, would you repeat that? I didn't hear you. And she said, you didn't hear me. <laughs> I said, uh, I have an ear infection and I didn't hear you. <laughs> I can't, that has stayed in my memory forever because when the truth it wasn't the truth I can't <laughs> believe you said that well believe it I did oh goodness <laughs> anyway that school um, yeah, thanks for bringing that to my memory <laughs> <laughs> sorry uh, that school had three stories on the top and three stories on the main floor and then you walk down a few steps to get in the basement where the cafeteria was and the restrooms were. And then you walked up that steps, that flight of steps, and you would get to the front door where you would, of course, go out onto the sidewalk, or you could go up another flight of steps where the first, second, third grade and a vacant room was. Then you would go up another flight of steps where there was an office. They had a desk and a few books in there and a telephone hanging on the wall. It was an old time telephone hanging on the wall. And that's what we used if we had to make a phone call, which we rarely ever, never had to do. Then you'd walk up another flight of steps and there would be the uh, fourth, fifth, and sixth grade and a vacant room. And we used the vacant room if we were having a, a presentation of any kind, we were all marched into that room. And the school had a, a bell that the janitor's name was Mr. Bush, and he would go to the, to the main level, and they had a big, wide rope, this big around, and he would pull down on it, and the bell would 
signal the time the recess was over. So we all filed back into school, back into the uh, main part of the school and learned our lessons. And I'm trying to think if there's anything else about that to tell. If I can think of the teacher's names, I know one. Uh, my mother went to school in Etna, and I have an article about the Etna school because she lived near Etna when she went here. This happens to be a story that I wrote about the Etna school about when I was working at the Journal Gazette. And her teacher was Mrs. Or Nina O'Day. That was her name. And when I got to be in first grade, Nina O'Day had become Nina McMullen, and she was my first grade teacher. So that's why I brought the Etna School, because it kind of pertained to both of us. Mm -hmm. And then the second grade, Mrs. Swinehart was the teacher, and Mrs. Chapelier was third grade. And what I remember about third grade, um, we, she had a concrete birthday cake. It was a two-layer concrete birthday cake, and if any of us had a birthday, she would get it out and put one candle in the top of it and have us to blow it out. <laughs> and it was disappointing because it wasn't real and we couldn't eat it. So enough of that story. Um, fourth grade was Mrs. Farr, and she was super nice. And that's where I learned my multiplication tables, and I was so scared in there because... I didn't think I was good in math, and I thought, I'll never be able to do this. And I just whizzed through the multiplication like nothing flat. And so she just put me at ease with that. But I was terrible in sports, horrible in sports. And when we'd always go out to recess and play ball, and we had to take turns being captain. And when it came my turn to be captain, and I chose my team, I got a good team. But I said, you guys all bat first. I'm going to bat last <laughs> because I was so terrible. And I think it was my eyes were bad. And I think I just couldn't see where the ball was. If I just realized or my mother had realized, I think maybe I would have been able to hit the ball better. Mm -hmm. So the fifth grade teacher then was Mrs. Roy. And I've already talked about her. And the sixth grade was Mrs. Queen. And that happened to be a teacher that my mother had at the Aetna School also. No, I'm sorry, she wasn't at the Aetna school. She was at the Nyoga grade school. But she taught my mother for a little while, and she taught me too. So Then we went to junior high. Junior high was located in the high school on one end. So it was the 7th and 8th grade there. And there were, there were uh, two rooms for 7th grade, two rooms for 8th grade, and... Mrs. Swisher was my homeroom teacher, and then uh, there was an another teacher for the other other room. And I, I had a very nice teacher. She was relaxed. She had children of her own, and she was relaxed, and she just was a good teacher. The other teacher had never had children, and she was more strict and more stern. But she taught orthography, which is something they don't teach anymore. Oh. But it was the study of words, and we had to divide, like, uh, umbrella into the syllables and then tell what each syllable meant, and that's how we got the meaning of our words. And we had to give book reports in there, too, which I hated. I didn't like speaking then, and I don't like speaking now. <laughs> <laughs> and then the eighth grade had Mistress Parrot for science and Mr. Boats for math. Then we graduated to high school, and it had three levels again. Uh, of course, the, the classes, you would go not stay in one room for all the classes. You just went to different rooms for those. But our, our science and biology teacher was Mr. McIntyre, who was the one that came down dressed as the ghost when I was babysitting. And he did not allow gum chewing in his science class and my cousin happened to be in the same class I was in and he had gum in his mouth and Mr. McIntyre saw it and he said 
Jackie, do you have gum in your mouth? And Jackie had to take the gum out and sit through the rest of the class with the gum on his nose. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I'm about storied out here. Oh, I'm sure you're not storied out. You, uh, tell us about college. Did you go on to college? I did, but not right away. I, I got married and raised our, our children. My husband and I did. And who are your children? Uh, James Allen, John Michael, Mark Stephen, and Daniel Lee. And when the youngest was about 15, I had always wanted to go to school, and they were getting old enough that I wasn't needed there much anymore, so I went to Lakeland College. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but uh, in the course of time, we figured out that journalism was what I liked to do, and so I was encouraged to pursue that course, and I did. And then I transferred over to Eastern, and I got, did my two years there and got my Bachelor of Arts in Journalism. And while I was going to school, I was also doing a, a working part-time at the Journal Gazette as a typist. So little articles that people would bring in and they needed typed up to put in the newspaper, that was my job. And because they knew what I was going to school for, they let me write headlines for and they also asked me if I would do the calling the funeral homes and get the obituaries and write the obituaries. So I did that while I was still in, at Lakeland College before I went to Eastern. And while I was at Eastern, uh, the lifestyle writer, there were two of them, one uh, from the Times Courier in Charleston and one from the Mattoon Journal Gazette, and the one in Charleston moved to uh, up north somewhere. So her position came open and Bill Lair asked me if I would like to take that position. I still had about, I don't know, two months to go before I graduated from Eastern. So I was trying to write my final exams, my thesis paper, uh, work at the Journal Gazette full time then and take care of my family. And it was challenge but we got through it we got through it and then I just they kept me on working there as the lifestyle writer which is what I did and I loved it because I I uh, got to go and interview various people that were experts in their field so it was fun now you were you said your youngest was 15 when you decided to go back to school. So how old were you when you decided, if you'll share that, when you decided to go I back to school? I think I was 39. Okay. Yeah, 39. I was scared to death. And at that time you yeah. decided you'd raised your family mm -hmm. and you still wanted right. wanted uh, to pursue your own interests and, and mm -hmm. do that. I worked at the paper for 20 years. And I retired and I stayed home about five years and one day somebody called me and said, would you be interested in just answering the phone at the Life Center? And I said, sure. Well, it turned into a lot more than answering the phone, but it's, it's a good job. I, I like meeting the people, talking with them and helping them when I can. So Sue has continued her journalism uh, work since she's come here to the Life Center. Um, we got her a computer, a laptop several years ago now, but she has taken that laptop and she does a lot with it. And she writes, she started out, she asked if she could do a interview article for our newsletter that we started a year or so ago. And so she interviews one of our seniors every month and gets a lot of good information out of them. And that's our front page article on our newsletter. And then gradually she just took the whole thing away from me and now she does it. And then she says, here, how's this? And so she pretty well puts our newsletter all together. And um, she's, we really appreciate that. And I, it goes out now to over 300 people throughout Clark and Cumberland County. We're mailed every month. And it's quite a monthly newsletter. It's always a full, full six pages. She always gets it done. And when she says, here, how's this? And I'll say, 
Mm, let's put one more or two more or maybe three more articles in here about something very important. And uh, she puts it all in there and uh, makes sure that it it goes out. And, and uh, so she's still st using her journalism degree, and we really appreciate that. I know that. So you've worked here at the Life Center, and you worked at the Journal Gazette. Have you ha worked any other places? I did, but it was I was also raising a family at the time, so it was nothing big. I I sold home interiors and gifts for five years uh, on the party plan. I load mm -hmm. up the car with pictures and all kinds of things, and go around to people's houses and show them how to decorate where to place things on their walls and what looked good together and what didn't. And um, I also worked part-time uh, for Ralph White, who lived behind the Neoga Cemetery, and he uh, made radio-controlled airplanes mm. and shipped them everywhere. But my job was there were large molds of fuselages and I would cut cloth and lay it inside and then mix up um, plastic that would harden with resin mixed into it and I painted the fiberglass cloth which would dry and then Ralph would trim the cloth and put the two pieces of the fuselage together and we shipped those everywhere. I worked I had that job for probably a year or two, I suppose. Yeah. And I worked at Kern Manufacturing, too. Uh, I made girdles. I sewed the elastic on the legs of girdles. Okay. <laughs> and babysat. That's about, that's my life. Well, and I also know she cans out of her garden. She always had, her and Bob have a garden every year. And she takes care of the garden and cans lots of green beans and tomatoes. And she also cans for friends and people who are not fortunate enough to have a garden or to be able to can. And so she'll can a special, uh, several cans of tomatoes for someone who's on a salt-free diet and, and, or something. And she's always doing something special. And I forgot to mention one of the other things she do, uses her, her not necessarily journalism, but her experience in writing, is she writes all of the thank you letters and uh, makes sure everybody gets a birthday card here at the Life Center. And uh, that is quite a feat. Sometimes she'll have 30 or 40 thank you cards. She writes every one by hand, and she, each one is very personalized. Um, and she makes sure everyone gets a a kind thank you from the Life Center when they do something for us. So that's very valuable. And um, we also appreciate that. So um, we asked on here, what is the least enjoyable work you've had? I can't remember what I wrote down well, there. Well, you wrote, you wrote <laughs> sewing uh, oh, at Oh, yeah, I don't like to sew. That is true. I. Some people say sewing relaxes me, but it just ties me in knots. <laughs> I don't like it at all. Isn't that something? Um, yeah. I've lived in Cumberland County since I was four years old in the Neoga area. So I know Neoga. <laughs> and she still yeah. lives in the country, and so she, like, mo like most people who live in the country, they like, like the country. They yeah. like the country, and that mm -hmm. whether they, they have a well that's not always good or whether they have power that's not always there or the phone is not always working they never say I'd like to move into town no. <laughs> nobody <laughs> says that because everybody loves to live in the in the country well we thank you so much for your time and all your work that you've done to get all these memories together I know that as you went through all these things it it uh, made you think of things that you haven't it thought did. of for a long time. Thank you for having me. I enjoyed it. Oh. I didn't think I was going to enjoy it, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> well, you're a very wonderful speaker, and we really appreciate it. Uh, you've shared a lot of interesting things about, about uh, Cumberland County and about your family and uh, your ancestors that, that people will be find interesting in the future. So 
Bye bye for now. Thanks for joining us. I hope you enjoyed talking with Carolyn Sue Smizer, better known as Sue Smizer. And uh, hopefully you will see this in 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years. And you'll look back and you'll say, oh, that was my great, great grandmother. <laughs> and uh, they'll just love, they'll love to see you in action, so to speak. So thank you so much. And thank you for joining us.